Hi everybody, welcome to our lecture for chapter 5 in the DeFore textbook, which is focused on developing a guaranteed or viable curriculum in your school. So, a lot of this chapter talks about what curriculum looks like and what it's supposed to look like um, and how it benefits a school. Remember the audience that this book is written to. Is the, is the audience um, are the audience all doctoral students for this book? No. This is taught in school districts. This is taught in um, sort of master's programs, but we're using it for a doc class. My gut tells me that you do not want, want to sit here and listen to me basically lecture about, um, about curricular major topics, but I think the next two chapters you really should read on your own if you want a review of curriculum or assessment. These lectures won't be longer than eight or nine minutes. I don't have much to say here because I trust in your judgment to be able to read the book and to be able to use it to your benefit for things that you particularly need. So when we talk about textbooks and curriculum, a lot of times um, the, the, curricu you know, the curriculum are the standards, and I, I've said that before, but the textbook does not dictate what the course is. The textbook is there to enhance what the standards and the main takeaway objectives for the course is. This course is introducing you to concepts in school reform. It's also introducing you to breakthrough ideas. Professional learning communities are one of the breakthrough ideas. So we use the textbook to introduce these reform concepts and to talk about how they look and how they work in schools. I think it's important to note that teachers interpret curriculum however the heck they want to. Um, they can read a textbook and get different ideas out than some of them. Teachers want to teach to their preferences. Um, we all do. As a college professor, if I had my way, I'd be teaching organizational theory and finance every single class. I love those courses. But teachers are the same way. Um, they want to teach their preferences. They want to teach the styles they like. If a teacher likes lecturing, they're going to teach a lot. If they, um, if they like doing small group activities, that's going to be a regular part of their class. Um, it's difficult to avoid those natural biases, and sometimes we just have to accept them. And honestly, there's nothing wrong with accepting them. So, in a true PLC, the curriculum should be discussed, and the teachers should work together to come up with what the curriculum is trying to teach. The big idea is what are the students learning and what does that learning look like? So just looking at a textbook and looking at standards doesn't mean anything unless the teachers are working together to design the learning activities. Once again, I think that's a no-brainer for every single one of you. Um, and I think it's a big idea that you have to consider. So it's important that you study the curriculum together that you agree on what the big ideas are, look at ways that, that can be incorporated into activities. I like the notion of a pacing guide for curriculum. Um, one thing that I always tell, that I always just tell, used to tell my teachers when I was talking to them about curriculum guides um, in early childhood, I would always say built in five days for emergencies because you can always push something back and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but in this model, you have to make sure that those pacing guidelines are there and that the agreed upon curriculum is being taught and it makes sense for everybody that's involved in the process. You have to make sure that everybody knows what the big ideas are in the skills that educators must acquire because they have to know what the results are supposed to be, what they're supposed to look like, and what they can do to get the results that they want. And this has to be agreed upon. If this isn't agreed upon, then we got a problem. There have to be specific outcomes that are determined by the group of teachers, um, and, and, and that is a very, very, very important idea. So I'm not going to insult you about what a learning objective is. Um, I'm going to give you a few takeaway messages. If you don't know what a learning objective is, um, I would strongly encourage you to get to know that stuff um, as somebody who might be out of your field. But learning objectives are, you know, are a key core component that everybody in education should know and should be able to do in some form, and I truly believe that. So they should be definitive and focused on, and focused on one specific outcome. This here is something that I don't see teachers doing, and I always used to say this to my early childhood students because it bothered me to no end. Don't combine learning objectives. It should be one specific outcome that you want those students to do. Do not combine them, please, because if, if you're combining them, then there's no way of knowing if they met all or some of the learning objective, and that can be a problem as well. Um, try to build foundational and then add in the higher level objectives as the students are capable of, of, of 
uh, meeting those uh, meeting those goals. So there is no correct number of learning objectives. Um, you could have you know five, six, or seven in a lesson, or you know five, three or four global big ones. But try to find a way that the learning objectives are linked to those major global objectives. Um, and I think if you can get that down, that's one of the biggest ideas that you can take away from professional learning communities. How are each of the individual learning objectives actually related and linked to the big global objectives that are going on in the school? So professional uh, proficiency skills, excuse me, um, the chapter really delves into that in the next chapter, but it's going to look at assessment and evaluation and what proficiency should look like. Um, you really, relating this to what you can see and what your teachers are able to see, you should be able to know if you have a student that has mastered a skill, kind of has it, needs scaffolding to accomplish it, or doesn't have it at all. Um, we're really going to look at that in depth in the next chapter, and that really ties into our assessment model. So, like I said, I'm, I don't have a very long lecture for the next chapter. I'm probably going to record it right now because it's a quick one. Um, I, I want to give you a general overview of assessment because you might not have had it in a while, or since you haven't had it in research courses, um, I'll go over it during the lecture. But I think it's important just to see some takeaway messages, some ideas about assessment, so that you can uh, so that you can look at them from a different perspective. If I can do anything to help, as always, let me know. Hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you.